And um, okay. Okay, let's start with Gusho. Put your hands together, please. Namami datsu, namami datsu, namami datsu, namami Okay. Um, so today's topic is kind of heavy, so I hope you could stay with me because it is a little bit um, heavier than some of the others, um, especially last week. We went over uh, Soga Sensei's lectures uh, that he gave at the Los Angeles Best Swim, and I, I still recommend the book. It's very good, but it's a, it was a kind of a kinder, kinder gentler version of Soga than um, normally what... Uh, we study when we talk about Reverend Soga. And um, I think most of you already are aware of this book, Cultivating Spirituality. It has um, uh, Kiyozawa, Kaneko, Soga, and Yasuda in there. And um, uh, also you can find Soga's um, translations in a few anthology. I think Gary Link mentioned the uh, Alfred Bloom one. And then in Ken Yamada's article, which I'm going to show on the screen, he mentions the uh, Michael Pye anthology uh, that does include uh, a soga piece. So I'm going to go ahead and start with my screen. Oh, so today, mostly I'm going to be talking about this article called Dharmakara Bodhisattva from the Eastern Buddhist Journal. Some of you are aware the Eastern Buddhist is a, um, it started with DT Suzuki publishing English translations from Otani University. Um, it comes out maybe once or twice a year, but they, it's some fabulous stuff. And maybe that's something Shinshu Center of America can consider is maybe putting in book form some of those great um, articles from the Eastern Buddhists. So uh, a, a scholar that joins the um, weekly Kyogyo Shinsho reading class that uh, Professor Aaron Prophet does online. His name um, is Chris Callahan. He's a professor at University of Illinois. Uh, he gave me a copy of this um, article that's a uh, translation of Soga, which I found is really helpful for me. So I'm gonna be talking mostly from that article. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. Let's see. Okay, here. Okay, share. And then let me put it on, um, <clears throat> if I can figure out how to do slideshow. Okay, thank you, sweetheart. Okay, so everybody should be seeing the screen now. Okay, uh, <laughs> okay. So some of you said that uh, your version of the cultivating spirituality didn't have pictures. So I wanted to show the picture that I re was referring to last time. Uh, Sogo Rojin as a, a young man, they think around 30, but I made a comment that he looks like Freddie Mercury. <laughs> and so instead of um, Bohemian Rhapsody, today we're going to get Bodhisattva Rhapsody. <laughs> so he's going to be talking about uh, Dharmarkara uh, Bodhisattva, which a lot of you already know from, is Hozo Bosatsu. And one of the things that Soga does is uh, normally when we talk about Pure Land, we go into the story of Amida Buddha, but he really wanted to look at the beginning of the story where uh, we start with Dharmakara Bodhisattva, and you know, like Shoshinge, um, uh, <clears throat> the, the, we talk about the beginning stage of uh, Hozo Obosa uh, Iniji, <laughs> the beginning stage uh, that they talk about in the larger sutra. So for Soga, he thought this was the key to talking about um, Jyoro Shinshu in this kind of modern approach. So, so in the Cultivating uh, Spirituality, there's two essays uh, translated by Jean Van Braun. He's a Belgian Catholic priest. And um, the first one in the book, uh, Savior on Earth, he, he talks about, he got the idea uh, of talking about Dharmakara um, when he talked with his friends Kaneko and uh, Haya Akegarasu, and we'll be talking about Akegarasu in a couple of months, but we talked about Kaneko a couple of months ago. So these people were talking to each other all the time and bouncing ideas off each other. Um, so he bounced that idea off of them and came up with this essay in 1913. Um, and to me, it sounds like he's kind of uh, trying to um, tweak not just the Buddhists, but the Christians as well, by using this framework of saying uh, the a savior on earth and using the word advent uh, 
taking these terms from Christianity. Um, so it's kind of a provocative essay. He, you could tell at his young age, he's trying out something kind of radical to kind of tweak everybody to get everybody's attention. So the idea of Dharmakara coming to earth as a savior, uh, just like in the Christian tradition, they, in, at Advent time, the time right before Christmas, they talk about the savior is coming. So in that essay, yeah, he, it's, it's, he's being provocative by using that framework. And then the other essay, Shinran's View of Buddhist History, also in the Cultivating Spirituality, he kind of continues the theme of Hozo Bosatsu, of Dharmakara Bodhisattva being the beginning, not Shakyamuni Buddha, but the story of Dharmakara uh, pointing to something way before Shakyamuni Buddha. And so here's the um, um, reference to Reverend Ken Yamada's uh, look at that essay. It's on the Higashi Honganji USA.org. Um, so this slideshow, I'll, I, I'll, I can make it available as a PDF if anyone <laughs> needs it. Um, and also uh, will be available in the recorded version as well. So if you go to higashihonganjiusa.org, uh, you'll find essays uh, that Reverend Yamada has been doing on these teachers that I've been talking about. Um, but one of the things with Hozo Bosa to Dharmakara Bodhisattva is um, if you have listened to Dr. Nobu Haneda, he often quotes Soga saying this line, um, Dharmakara becomes me in order to liberate me, but I am not Dharmakara. Uh, I've heard, I'm sure somebody who listened to Dr. Haneda have heard him say that Dharmakara becomes me in order to liberate me, but I am not Dharmakara. And it's kind of a head scratcher in a lot of ways. Um, and so a lot of the discussion uh, with Soga's concept of Dharmakara um, didn't make a lot of sense to me until, um, I, it's making more sense to me now that we're talking more about intergenerational trauma. And um, in uh, I, I mentioned last month, that that's a discussion a lot of Japanese Americans are having because they're finding, even though the camp experience happened 80 years ago, it's the trauma of it is still affecting the third and fourth generation. And just I try to summarize what I said last month that um, there's a psychologist who was studying the uh, Holocaust survivors descendants. And she found that the children were getting treated for anxiety and depressions at, at a pretty high rates, but she was surprised the grandchildren of the Holocaust survivors were also experiencing um, depression and anxiety. And so uh, she heard about this experiment that was done that on lab rats, laboratory rats, where they exposed um, one generation of laboratory rats to a cherry smelling scent. And when they would smell it, they would hit the buzzer and the poor mice would get shocked. <laughs> so they got them to associate the cherry smell with being shocked. But then they found out the children of that mice, if you just release the cherry smell, they would jump like they were being shocked, even though there was no shock happening to them. So this idea of, of intergenerational trauma, I think is very real. And, and uh, there's a lot of discussion about it. One of the discussions you might've heard is there's a movie called uh, Turning Red. Uh, about the young lady that turns into a, a red panda. <laughs> but anyways, it's, it's an animation, but um, a uh, Asian American writer says she's watching the movie with her uh, child. And the child said, usually in these you know, any animated movies, there's a villain. And, and the child said, well, who's the villain in this movie? And the mother said, intergenerational trauma. <laughs> so if not that you, I haven't seen the movie yet, but there's this, it seems to be a theme in a lot of the uh, uh, movies about Asians coming out. Uh, I understand that uh, that idea of intergenerational trauma, that what the parents went through uh, does affect their children. And so uh, so this very old concept in Buddhism called Alaya Vijnaya, uh, Vijnaya na, or in Japanese Alaya Shiki, uh, is translated as storehouse consciousness. Um, and I remember Dr. Nessa, you can remember Alaya means storehouse because the mountains in the north part of India are called Hima Alaya, 
meaning Himalaya, we say, but it's, Hima is snow and Alaya is storehouse. So the Himalayan mountains are the storehouse of snow. So that's where you can see that word um, coming up. And so uh, in the dictionary, the, the Buddhist dictionary, they define it as consciousness forming the base of all human existence. And if you go on Google to um, look up the word, you'll, you'll see a bunch of pictures of robots <laughs> uh, from some anime, anime series that somehow they use that word in the, in the anime. I, I don't ask me how, but it comes up. Um, but I, I like to call it intergenerational aspiration. And so instead of trauma, let's talk about intergenerational aspiration that comes to us, not just through our environment, but in almost like, it's almost like genetics. It's imprinted in our DNA, this aspiration that's been handed down. And I, I say it's a wish for peace, a wish for overcoming the self-centeredness that leads to violent destruction. And um, I was hoping to find a slide of it, but uh, you just have to use your imagination those of you who saw the movie 2001, um, A Space Oddity, Odyssey, I'm sorry, Odyssey, there's a scene where they show prehistoric times where there's these uh, creatures that are uh, kind of ape-like, but they're supposed to be early humans. And they show that when um, the obelisk or whatever comes to um, make them smarter, um, they find that in, when they come in conflict with another band of these uh, ape-like humans um, instead of uh, just you know yelling and screaming at each other one of them picks up a bone from an animal and uses it as a weapon to bash uh, the opposing side and in that scene it's kind of you know it's the beginning of that human violence when your interests conflict with somebody else's interests and so the violence erupts. But at that same moment, I'd like to imagine that one of those ape-like creatures are looking at what's going on and having this aspiration, do we have to do it this way? Do we have to go there? Do we have to cause all this bloodshed and, and harm um, just because we're fighting over the same water hole or whatever? And so that's, to me, the, what I imagine is that um, primal aspiration, that aspiration, as soon as humans started uh, fighting with each other, at the same time, there's an aspiration for peace, that people are realizing there, it doesn't, shouldn't have to be this way. There should be a way to find, um, to overcome that greediness that leads to violence. So that's my idea of, um, primal aspiration coming from way back in our history as violence erupted, people are having this aspiration for peace and, and not getting, um, and realizing as, as the historic Buddha did that the, the reason for all this um, conflict is our uh, attachment to ego, our wanting to assert our primacy over other beings. Okay, so now we're going to get into the heavy stuff. And so this article that um, uh, Professor Callahan sent me uh, that's from the Eastern Buddhist is translated by Ito Emyo and Bando Shoju. And what I liked about it is um, maybe because I know the two people, but instead of going through John Von Brock, I thought it'd be good to um, read something by two translators who uh, knew Soga closely. They spoke Japanese so they can have conversations with him. So as we're doing this translation, they had Soga right there for them to bounce things off of. Um, Bando Shoujun, some of you are familiar with him. He's done a lot of uh, English translations. Um, and so I met him. He, at the time I was in uh, Otani, he was retired, but he did come to Kyoto to do uh, some lectures for a group that was visiting from Colgate University. So I got to meet him at that time. He's quite fluent in English. And if you read his writings, you also know he's, he's quite um, uh, knowledgeable and skillful in using English language. Uh, Ito Emyo, uh, I, I got to meet him through some friends when we went to hear him speak at the at um, Otani event. And um, he, is, he worked with DT Suzuki on the Kyogyo Shinsho um, translation. And actually, actually after D.C. Suzuki passed away, 
before he finished it, um, Ito Emyo did a lot of the work to get the manuscript up to publishable form. So he may not be as smooth an English speaker as Bando Sensei, but he's definitely someone who was well versed in um, describing Japanese Buddhist concepts in English. So I, I have a feeling these two, and also their closeness to Shoga Sensei, um, are doing a superb job of conveying in English what Soga Sensei is trying to get across. So this little explanation is a little bit, um, like I said, heavy, but just try to stay with me with it. Um, they're explaining Yoga Chara. It's, it's a school of Buddhism that's sometimes known as mind only. And so uh, this first paragraph, the six forms of consciousness, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind are mentioned by Theravada Buddhism, meaning the earlier Buddhism of the Southern country, but they alone are clearly not enough to explain the whole structure of our consciousness. Uh, those of you who chant Hanya Shingyo, the Heart Sutra, you've heard about the six forms of consciousness, uh, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and um, perceiving by concept in the minds. But uh, he goes on to say, but at the bottom of our six forms of consciousness, there's another consciousness which sustains our particular identity or ego. It's called manas. Um, it generates the impulse of grasping things as I and mine. So the six forms of consciousness don't have that graspingness, but there's another level below them uh, based that they're based on top of that have, has this um, grasping nature. But below that grasping nature or in the bottomless bottom <laughs> of our consciousness is the alaya vijnana. And uh, Soga explains, it never ceases to receive all things as they come. However defiled the whole consciousness may become by the working of the mana. So we all have, we're all aware of that mana, that level of thinking of grasping this. What, how is this thing that I'm seeing good for me or bad for me? But there's a level below that that just accepts it, just receives things as they come. Uh, and that's the pure consciousness. And so this alaya vijnana is no other than I in the most genuine sense. It is the seed of the realization of salvation in this life. Once awakened to the process by which the alaya vijnana comes to be defiled, one is already on the way to enlightenment. Enlightenment involves a dynamic process in which ignorance itself is infinitely subjected to the penetrating insight. So here, um, the word salvation and earlier and later, uh, Soga talked about savior. The salvation um, he's talking about is being freed from the manas, being freed from this graspingness that gets in the way of truly uh, being living your life in that deeper level of accepting all things. So I hope that makes sense to people that that's the salvation he's talking about. Um, so enlightenment is the process in which this ignorance, this level of manas is always subjected to insight. So as, as uh, deluded as people and as ourselves get, there's this um, uh, process where our delusion is being subjected to this penetrating insight. Okay, so next is, um, he does talk about the larger sutra story, which I'm not gonna go into here. Most of you, I think, know that story, um, especially you, you chant the Shoshinge, you, you kind of get a capsule version of the story. Um, and so here, Soga says, uh, when we read the larger sutra of eternal life in the, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce that, but just know that when these scholars mention these um, uh, other Buddhist texts, uh, sastra refers to a commentary as opposed to a sutra. And um, they are helping us because a lot of us don't get around to reading these texts and maybe they're not available in English translation even. Uh, so just to know like Shinran in Kyogyo Shinsho is helping us get a peek into some of these texts. So um, one advice I would give people, you don't need to go out and buy the translation of the Nirvana Sutra because Shinran gives you the best part in Kyogyo Shinsho. <laughs> so, uh, so it's because Soga Sensei has read this Sastra, this um, commentary on the mind only school, um, 
we don't necessarily have to know what it says, but uh, he's saying it's, it's backing up what the larger suture is telling us, which is we are made to realize that in the depths of our mind, we always hold the sincerest aspiration that springs from the alaya vijnana to become the inhabitants of that pure and truthful world. So that's the aspiration for a world that we can connect with the truth, what is pure, not defiled by our graspingness. So it's, it's that aspiration that springs up from our deepest consciousness that has been transmitted from time immemorial. Um, so he says this profound aspiration is apt to be disturbed by our waking consciousness by the beclouding influences of our impulses. That's our bono, you know, those um, driven things that we have to, to want this and that and avoid this and that or hate this and that. So our impulses. Yet the alaya vijnana is ever being transformed like a rushing torrent. So it's not just a nice gentle flow, but he's calling it a rushing torrent. Rather, it will manifest itself amid, amid illusory thoughts, break through all forms of ignorance of sentient being, and must someday fulfill all of its innermost aspirations. And I put this in a huge font because the word innermost aspiration uh, has been used as a translation of Hongan. Um, I, I don't remember, I was at some event and they said, oh, we, we really appreciate Reverend Marvin Harada for um, translating Hongan as innermost aspiration. And I said, no, he didn't start that. I said, he got that from Chicago. He spent six months in Chicago. And that's how we talk about Hongan as innermost aspiration. Um, it, it seems to be Reverend Yoko Saito and Dr. Nobu Hineda, when Hineda Sensei was in Chicago, came up with this um, way of describing Hongan. The Hong part is the innermost and gone is aspiration. But here I'm surprised that Ito Emyo and Bandal Shojun already came up with that phrasing, innermost aspiration, that this uh, aspiration inside us, this deep, deep primal aspiration uh, is innermost. It is um, Hongan. It, to just say primal vow in a lot of ways doesn't quite, uh, at least in my case, doesn't reach me, touch me, but to say innermost aspiration, uh, then Hongan makes sense as something really deep and transmitted from long, 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 long time uh, ago. So it's very, uh, so I, I like that translation. I do tend to use that, but I'm surprised Ito and uh, Bandos senseis came up with that. And then um, the next page, uh, Soga goes into quoting an earlier work that he wrote. Um, it is not that we sentient beings suddenly fell from heaven upon this earth, but that we are rooted deep in the earth. We have all sprung up out of the earth with a beginningless history behind us. This physical body ever haunted by defilements is only the outward crust of pure subjectivity. The actual body testified to by the heartfelt declaration of fundamental subjectivity, here I am, is by nature pure and spotlessly undefiled. In this undefiled body within each sentient being is stored up the ancestral heritage of the teaching from time immemorial. Each action and each movement we make are all done by the command of this teaching of which we are not conscious, that we're not conscious normally <laughs> think, you know, that's the role of Buddhism to make us aware of this teaching. So he's saying that this teaching is imprinted in our physical nature. It is in our genes, our, gene, our DNA and genes. Those are physical um, things that our body, that is in the cells of our body. Um, so DNA is just not in um, uh, <clears throat> you know, our, our reproductive organ. It's in all cells of our body, this DNA, this genetic imprinting. Uh, is in our body. Our bodies are made up of the matter of this earth. And so he says, yeah, we're not, um, we're not like the stork dropped us from on high, but we, our very being is from the earth. Our, our um, content, our, what makes this body, our body is made up of the elements of the earth. And so even though we, um, 
talk about defilements or I want this, I want that. That's only just the surface level. The deep, deep nature of our body, like in the very, in the very content of our cells on the cellular level um, is imprinted in us this um, deeper subjectivity. And so he says, here I am um, to know that I'm alive. This, I, I am in this um, combination of materials to make my life. And when I heard, saw that like, line here in my, I, I, I couldn't help but think of um, <laughs> the um, uh, Hanamatsuri statue that we all see, we're all gonna see in a couple of weeks that the Buddha uh, is reported to have said, above the heavens and below the heavens, I alone am most noble. So that's that cry of here I am. And uh, Reverend Gyoko Saito would say that's, you know, he got it from his teacher, Akegarasu, but he would say that is the birth cry. When the babies first yell <laughs> when they come out of their mother is here I am, you know, uh, above the heavens, below the heavens. Um, I am here, <laughs> I am this most noble being uh, put here on earth uh, and from the earth. And so, he makes that point, that's this heritage, this ancestral heritage, um, which is a teaching. So at the time when, like you said, that ape-like uh, early man is looking at his fellow, bang bashing in the head of uh, another being with the bone of the creature, uh, he's not only thinking this aspiration for uh, peace, but overcoming that, um, that violent nature, that violent drive. And there is a way to do that. And I, so even, so Soga is saying, even way back before history, people have realized um, to find the, to walk the path of transcending the ego attachment. So that's the teaching they have handed down to us. Uh, it, and it's whether it's, you can point to your own like parents or grandparents, but he's saying it's in our earthly nature that we have this teaching in us. And in fact, this teaching um, is, uh, commands all that we do. Uh, in a way, this is a way of saying uh, tadiki, the, the, the causes and conditions, but just the very nature of our bodies is, um, is this, uh, like I he in his previous like this torrent of flow that is um, making us take all our movements. So we're not aware of, um, we think we're you know, in control, but there's really something beyond us that is uh, moving our lives. So, <clears throat> so lastly, um, he wants to make the distinction, teachers are historical persons. So, like, so he wants to know that Buddhism did not start with Shakyamuni Buddha. He's the historical person who's a teacher bringing us this ancient wisdom. Uh, he himself is not our savior. He's, he himself as a person is not going to liberate us from uh, our defilements, from that graspingness. Uh, but the real savior for us, he says, is not our idealized historical characters, but the universal self, the fundamental self upon which is based our actual self. The real savior is Dharmakara Bodhisattva, who does not exist apart from this physical body of mine as fundamental subjectivity of myself. Manifesting himself in phenomenal bodies, Dharmakara Bodhisattva has become the living witness to his own actuality and thus deprives all futile arguments, illusions, dogmatism, superstitions, doubt, procrastination, controversies and so forth of their foundation. Therefore, he can be said to be a real savior leading our life to truth. And this is where that saying of um, the Soga starts to make sense. Dharmarkara becomes me in order to liberate me. Dharmarkara makes itself known to me in my own body, in my own cells. Um, this, this fundamental, um, I mean, this deep, deep aspiration in order to, to liberate me. And 
he does that with all um, beings. And you, you don't even have to say he at this point, that this Dharmakara is just become the story in the larger sutra is what you call an archetype. It's just a way to describe this very um, um, general and universal thing happening to all of us. But the story is helpful because it makes us realize it's an archetype. It shows us that when people wake up to the um, aspiration, when they 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 um, then they follow this path uh, of seeking. And so, um, so here maybe I'd just to say that the mark of the story was uh, he starts off as a king, and that is is symbolic of how we all start off in life thinking we're you know we're the, uh, the hot stuff and and that we tend to look down on others um, and other beings but by meeting a great teacher uh, by meeting that truth a person who's living in truth so um, his teacher's name is Lokesh Travel Raja the king who is free in this world Lokesh's world and the, the Swava is the freedom in the Raja's king he's the he's king of a world where he's totally free. Um, so by meeting this totally free person, then Dharmakara, that deep, deep aspiration is awakened in him. So if you, if you remember the larger sutra, uh, it doesn't start off with Dharmakara Lokeshwara Raja, but it kind of starts off with Deepankara um, Buddha, that uh, is, they have this whole laundry list of what, 53 people names, but it's just to give you the sense that Shakyamuni Buddha, who's telling this story, is saying it just goes on and on and on and on back, back, back in history that there's been several generations of people who have also um, walked this path, who also awakened this deep aspiration that began when people were wishing for peace, were wishing to, for this way to get away from the graspingness that leads to violence. So um, so now this makes sense. Uh, it makes a little more sense to me reading this words of Soga that um, Dharmakara um, is this, this um, consciousness that's in us that's been handed down uh, through many, many generations. So it's not just a Buddhist thing, but I, I think universally um, in all religion, there's the same aspiration they may express it differently but um but in jodashishu we have this story to let us know that there is this archetype and this is the archetype that comes in that we awaken to that is already in our body that's already in our cells and so that's why he says any arguments you know all this theoretical stuff does is is not it doesn't have any foundation because it's still based on the manas, still based on that level of um, graspingness. But this story of Dharmakara and the story of the innermost aspiration um, is the foundation. And as um, Soga Sensei often says, this is it's the ground. It's the ground that we are on. It's it's coming out from. Uh, earth. And then Soga also is very good at talking about our bodies in a very concrete way. So it's not like there's some soul, some spirit inside this casing, but our very bodies are um, the vehicle of our uh, liberation, the vehicle of the Alaya Vijna, that it's working through not just our head, but through our very cells. And so that's why um, <clears throat> Soga since they use the idea of um, standing on the earth that were based on the earth. Um, so that that's now now it starts to make sense reading through this this uh, exposition that um, Dharmarka is not this outside person that is like um, doing avatar with us coming into our body to um, mess around with our thinking, but it's it, it's a symbol for what's already in our bodies and is trying to wake us up to um, that that very basic level of consciousness, and I think for a lot of it, this doesn't sound unfamiliar. You realize this is what when they say "come as you are," you know, the idea of uh, accepting things as a whole. You know, this all comes from that same idea of the Yoga Chara talking about that basic um, 
uh, level. So I'm going to go back <coughs> up to, um, let's see, oops, uh, okay, stop share. Uh, that, that, that is the way I, uh, this very heavy stuff of Soka, of course he has other topics, but if you read all of his, his writings from that very beginning when he talked about the savior on earth, that idea of looking at Dharmakara, uh, instead of talking about Amida Buddha, so that's why it's very interesting that he shifts up to the cause, the causal stage to look at, this is a way for us to um, see that story, not as some uh, legend, but as describing this very uh, transmission that has come intergenerational. So this transmission of the um, intergenerational, what I call intergenerational aspiration that has come to us. Um, and I, I guess one of the things you might notice in this presentation and maybe some of my other presentations is I, re I really feel that the basic teaching of Buddhism uh, from the very get-go is about overcoming our ego to avoid, to get past the violence, that conflict um, that results from conflict. And the only way to um, deal with the conflicts we come into with other beings is to let go of that graspingness. Um, and so the Buddha himself was going to be a warrior, but he um, ran away from that. Uh, wanting something, um, wanting to find a path away from that peace. So, um, so a lot of Buddhism talks about this inner peace, um, but I think really Buddhism should talk about we're in a relational world. We're in a world of relations. And what is so important, even especially now, is to listen to the teachings of uh, finding ways to work out our conflicts and not resort to violence and to not look at other people as expendable it's, uh, it's okay to bash in their heads with the bone um that that i think that's where the basic aspiration goes so in the reading of the hongan it's to see all beings as enlightened and and all the the vows 48 vows is i i always feel is way to get past our, our uh, graspingness where we want to look down on people for this or that, but realizing that in, in this true pure world that Soga describes in this article, that these differences are not a rationale for uh, discrimination, that all beings are accepted as they are. And so that idea of uh, being grasped and not abandoned is the very essence of this innermost aspiration of what we call Hongan. Um, so, but um, Soga goes about it using the yoga chada, the, that mind only vocabulary. And, uh, but I think those people really realize that, uh, and one of, one of the things I like about yoga chada, they realize we're, we're not just these aut autonomous beings with agencies that we can just break a habit like that. Uh, they realize we are our results of layers and layers of causes and conditions and um and they talk they, they talk about all this you know causes and conditions as seeds and perfumes and stuff like that but i think if you look at intergenerational um aspiration then you realize that's what um soga is getting into with the mind only people and i think now like i mentioned that experiment with the lab rats it's really true that we are this, uh, our head is not just the command center of our life, but our very cell, cellular level contains this teaching, contains the Dharma, contains this aspiration. And all we need is to listen to those teachers and um, hope and help, and they will help us um, to become more aware of letting that, um, uh, I'm trying to think what was that phrase you used, letting that, that light of wisdom um, penetrate, that the penetrating insight to let our glob of delusions and prejudices, let that, that penetrating insight of the wisdom keep hitting us, keep hitting that and keep breaking through. So uh, just like in the Shoshinge, we talk about the, the light um, 
is beyond the clouds. So the let, let that light come through the clouds. So that's why we get together and um, um, listen to the Dharma. But Soga just really brings out the idea, it's in our bodies. You know, it's, it's, it's just, um, uh, we should appreciate this body. It's not just in our head, but to appreciate our lives in this very bodily concrete way. Um, and with knowing that the aspiration is in the very cells, um, I think it gives that story of the mark a little different feel than um, we normally approach or how for, it, like I said, what I call your grandma, my grandma's <laughs> Jodo Shinshu. Uh, Dharmakara maybe for them was kind of a story, was kind of a, um, not so much a legend, but a lot of, some people have talked to, they, they actually think it was an actual happening. And um, it, it, that Shinran is in the Shakyamuni are talking about something that actually happened to a particular person at a particular time, but no, the larger suture makes clear that it's it's really a archetype. It's really talking about um, a framework for understanding this intergenerational aspiration, this imprinted aspiration that's in our very body. So, um, so I know it was a lot of, like I say, heavy stuff. So maybe some people can let me know if, if it makes a little sense to them or um, it's still kind of, confusing, but this is a very important theme that um, Soga takes up throughout his writings. So, and of course, I, like I said last month, I, I have a long way to go and, and really um, delving into Soga's teaching. So I hope uh, in the future, maybe we can all learn some more uh, together. And also that the Shinshu Center of America will publish more English translations. Okay. So if someone has a comment or question, just 